So good afternoon. Uh, welcome uh, to this uh, distinguished lecture. Uh, as you know, a few words about uh, this program, uh, and then I will leave uh, Paolo Villoresi to introduce uh, the speaker. Let me first uh, say that it is uh, a great pleasure for me to have here uh, Tony Asin from, uh, from um, Barcelona, uh, the Institute of Photonic Science. Uh, Tony today will speak us about uh, the quantum, uh, um, quantum physics and what we can do with this. But before this, then Paolo will be more uh, precise. I want just uh, to say how much important is for us this event. Uh, I am happy to see many, many, many persons, many students. This is especially for all of you that we are organizing this, having giving you the opportunity to open a little bit the spectra of what we are doing your research. And uh, the idea is that these lectures try to give you a nice introduction in fields in which maybe you are not very much uh, uh, deep into and uh, you can have a new knowledge and maybe you can see some interaction. So this, this lecture, this uh, program of the Distinguished started in 2004. So this is the 15 years we are doing it. We are very proud that we have uh, a nice program also this year. This is the third lecture we are doing uh, this year. And uh, I am happy that you are here and I hope you will enjoy the program. After, after this, I leave uh, Paolo. Please introduce the speaker, thank you. Thank you, Director. Good afternoon, everyone. Well, it's a great pleasure for me to introduce uh, Professor Antonio Tony Hassin, uh, that uh, represents an excellence in uh, the quantum information domain. Uh, he is um, uh, an outstanding researcher. Uh, I will briefly go through the, the curriculum, which has a strong overlap with our institute, because he is presently holding the ICREA Research Professor uh, Professorship at ICFO, the Institute for Quantum Photonic in Castel de Fes, uh, near, near Barcelona. He has a, a, a degree in uh, telecommunication engineering uh, from the University of Polytechnica of Catalonia and in physics uh, at the University of Barcelona. And then a PhD in theoretical physics uh, from the University of Barcelona uh, that uh, well, uh, finished in, in 2001. Okay. He had a postdoc uh, period uh, in Geneva in uh, the group of uh, Nicolas Jussain, which was also a, a distinguished speaker here at this series, and uh, then he joined ICFO in 2003. Okay. Uh, he's now uh, leading the quantum information theory group there, okay. and um, he's also the recipient of an AXA chair uh, that uh, is uh, supporting the research for five years. That is a worldwide competition. Uh, that was uh, awarded to ICFO and is the first recipient of this uh, uh, 25 years uh, duration uh, in, in slot of uh, five years. Okay. Um, Besides these things, uh, it's the recipient of uh, uh, essentially uh, three uh, ERC grant and uh, one uh, proof of concept, say so in total four uh, ERC um, awards uh, that, um, uh, that are so the ty different types. Okay. Uh, and just to, 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 to describe a bit the, the, the context, uh, uh, the first of it was a starting grant uh, was uh, on uh, the quantum network. So how to, uh, say, go beyond the point-to-point -point, uh, uh, type of connection, creating a network, which is something that, of course, uh, resonates also very well with our effort in doing uh, networks. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the, the idea of uh, Tony on this was to actually do a quantum enhancement of these networks, okay, using the qubit instead of the bit uh, for this, okay. The second one uh, uh, was uh, on, a, on a topic that is also um, characteristic of the quantum information, that is the divine device independentness, uh, which is uh, something that uh, is beyond uh, the, uh, the type of connection that you can have with the, uh, with the classical type of communication, okay. And the, and the, and the, and the, thir the, the thir third ERC, which, uh, which is an advanced, advanced grant, and it will start next next year next year is on certification on quantum technology which is again a, a very actual <coughs> and important topics that to say uh, put on a say solid base the uh, the quantum technologies together with uh, with the classical one okay um, in general as you have seen uh, his uh, expertise is in quantum information theory that is uh, his uh, main research uh, uh, interest uh, uh, and as a tool is of course uh, uh, using the characteristic of it, so the, the entanglement and quantum non-locality that you can exploit uh, by, by using uh, entangled qubits. 
uh, and also work on quantum communication protocols like the one that are needed say, for instance to share a key or many other things um, the, the research goes uh, from abstract theoretical problems uh, to experimental demonstration of quantum information pro protocols in the sense that um, explain uh, the, 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 the role of the theoretical uh, leader in uh, also experiments that uh, have provided new results to this okay um, <laughs> the, there are issues uh, uh, like uh, quantum foundation problems uh, that may say provide a new concept that uh, will become uh, protocols and, 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 and techniques uh, after a few years of uh, elaboration but that uh, need to be uh, say tested uh, proposed and tested uh, experimentally first and this is sort of the the fundamental part and, and, and the protocols. And today, the topic is also uh, related to this subject, it is on the randomness. The randomness is a, is a great resource that is needed in many, many aspects of simulation, com com communication, uh, uh, also many, many applications. And uh, as we all know, that the, there were, uh, say, uh, evidences of uh, bad use uh, or good use uh, of this randomness uh, that, uh, that emerged also from, uh, say, uh, the, 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 the chronicle of uh, misdeed and things like that. And so uh, in this sense, uh, uh, quantum information, um, say, propose uh, alternatives uh, to these uh, th this technique that uh, usually are algorithmical based. And uh, well, we'll hear uh, this afternoon on the idea and the perspective of, of these things. Uh, that, uh, that uh, again are very transversal in, in the department. So uh, please join me in welcoming Professor Asin. And uh, with this, I will give him the word for this. Okay. So, uh, okay, thank you very much for the nice words and the nice introduction. And thanks also for the invitation to come here. I'm very happy to be uh, in Padova in Italy because. Uh, Part of my genes come from Italy. So in fact, if you look at my second name, it's Dalmaschio, a very Italian family name. And in fact, my f I have family who came from Venice. So I'm very close to my roots when coming here. And uh, well, just to, I mean, when deciding about the, the, the topic of my colloquium, we were exploring several possibilities. And in the end, we agreed that uh, randomness could be a nice topic. And I think it somehow illustrates uh, in a in a good way, uh, some of the, the way we work in uh, my group. So it's random is a fundamental concept, but uh, also it's a practical concept. So usually what we try to do in my group is to work on uh, um, concepts that are fundamental for our understanding of quantum physics, and then we make use of it. In, I mean, you can think that uh, in quantum technologies, what you really want to do, you want to understand those properties that are intrinsic to quantum physics. Is my micro working? Yes. So those properties that are intrinsic to quantum physics that do not have a classical analog. And once you have something that only exists in quantum physics, you want to use it to do things that are not possible in classical information theory. Okay, so this is more or less what you try to do. And this is what we try to do for the topic of randomness. And this is what I'm going to tell you about. And uh, also in my talk, uh, at some point, I mean, it will go also from so some discussions that they may sound a bit more speculative or uh, I wouldn't say philosophical, but OK, just about discussion about quantum foundation, let's say. And uh, we can s summarize the talk as, as this. Okay, So the goal is to prove the existence of randomness in nature and make use of it. Okay, So this is more or less the summary. If you are lazy, you can leave now the room. If not, you can stay with me until understanding what I mean by this. Okay, And perhaps we should start by defining randomness. Okay, So usually, when we have randomness, we think of a device that produces output. And there is an observer or a observer if you want to think of fundamental terms or you have a user who wants to make use of this randomness doesn't matter observer user so this user has this box and this device and this device produces b symbols say bits and you want to know whether these bits are random okay so there are many ways of defining this the way i, I will use and if you want to read more about this we wrote a review for nature uh, two and a half years ago with the masanes so the way we define there, and I think it's a very uh, operationally uh, consistent definition, is that I would say that a process or, or a device is random if it's unpredictable. And by this, I would mean not only to the observer, but to any observer who can uh, be uh, correlated with this device. Okay? So 
What I will call is that this observer cannot predict these outputs, but not only him, but anyone else. Then I will make explicit what I mean, more explicit, more clear what I mean by this. But anyone else uh, cannot predict this output. Okay, so this is my definition. It has to be something unpredictable, not only to the person who is looking to the symbols, but to anyone else. Okay, so I think this is uh, satisfactory because, I mean, I think from a fundamental point of view, if I, I see some outputs and I cannot predict, but someone else can predict, well, I wouldn't say this is random. Okay, it's random to me, but not to him. So I think from a fundamental perspective, it makes sense. And also, many of the uses of randomness we want to do, we want to use randomness as something unpredictable that it can use to do something useful. And usually what we really need from this randomness is this unpredictability. So if I can use this randomness, especially for cryptographic application, it's better that this randomness, things are random not only to me, but also to anyone else, including my enemy. So by demanding this uh, unpredictability by other people, I'm demanding that this randomness is private. So it's not only me who cannot guess these outputs, but and everyone else. Okay, so this is what I'm going to demand. So I will demand that the symbols I see are unpredictable to me, but also to my possible enemy. Okay, then you will see how we are going to do that, because in principle it seems quite difficult to argue that I have something here and no one else can predict what I have. Okay, so then uh, if you start, if you put randomness in these terms, I hope they are more or less clear at this point in time, then I, I hope the scope of my talk is for you to understand what I mean and what we, you can do this with quantum physics. Well, the first message is that uh, to certify, to generate something that is random from scratch, it's impossible. Okay, strictly speaking, you can see that you cannot argue that something is random just without making any hypothesis, any assumptions on your device. And this is because, okay, it may seem a bit stupid, but this is what it is. I mean, there is always the possibility that whatever I see is written in advance. Okay, so I see some outputs produce, produced by my box. I can never exclude that these outputs were written by someone else and this person has a list of the outputs that are going to be produced by my box. Okay, it might seem a bit crazy, but this is a possibility, logical possibility that I can never exclude by looking at outputs being produced by my device. So, just trying to prove, so we need to do something to prove the existence of randomness, so we need to make some assumptions about my device. And then we can prove the existence of randomness. It may be a tautology for you, okay? But what I'm saying is that I need to make some assumptions to prove that a device produces randomness. So this is what I'm going to do. Since I'm a physicist, also an engineer, but I'm also a physicist, well, I will work with physics and I will make assumptions about my devices. So I will assume that these devices are physical devices and then they obey some physical laws. Again, this may seem a tautology, but if you're strict, this is an assumption, okay? If I say that this laptop satisfies Newtonian laws, this is an assumption. We, all, we are all happy with this. If I say that the uh, photons in uh, Paolo's labs behave according to quantum physics, I would call this an assumption. Then I will, my goal is to prove that some numbers, some symbols are unpredictable to any physical observer. So I will assume that everyone, including my enemy, is bounded by these physical laws quantum physics, and then these actions will limit his predictability of my output. And this is why, assuming the validity of some physical laws, I, would be a, I will be able to conclude that some processes are random. Okay, so we are going to prove uh, uh, that a process is random using physics. So let's just start by considering classical physics. Okay, does randomness exist in classical physics? Well, no. Okay, so there is nothing like randomness in classical physics because uh, wh whatever you see that looks unpredictable to you is just a matter of ignorance. Okay, so classical physics tells you that you have some initial conditions and you have perfect knowledge about the uh, position and velocities. You can predict the future and even the past. Okay, you simply solve the... Okay, this might be difficult, but what I'm saying is that in principle, given perfect knowledge about your conditions, you can predict the the future and there is nothing unpredictable. So things may be unpredictable because you have partial knowledge or you have imperfect devices. But of, for sure this unpredictability you can 
diminish by having better knowledge or having better devices. So it's just uh, an artifact of your ignorance or your limited knowledge. And for instance, the example is the roulette. Okay, if you play roulette, this is random. But if you have a better mod, a very good model for the roulette and the ball, you can predict the result. Okay? In fact, there, is, there was a family in Spain. There is even a book and a movie about this family. They are, were called Los Pelayos. The Pelayo was the family name. So this family noticed that there were some roulettes that were used in some casinos in Spain. And they had a bias. And they were sending all the family members to Spain and getting money until they realized, I mean, this, you can read about it, okay? So I'm not inventing them. Probably there's even a Wikipedia entry about this family. So they were banned to go to the casinos because they understood that they have a better knowledge about the roulette, and this is why they had less randomness, which shows you that, well, actually, there is no randomness, uh, strictly speaking, in this process. OK, so in classical physics, randomness is just a consequence of ignorance of our limitations. But the theory does not contain any form of randomness. OK, and there is a quote by Laplace that you can read or well, it depends on you if you have, want to spend some time. But basically, what Laplace says is that, uh, that there is an intellect that has enough computational power. For this intellect, there is nothing would be uncertain. Okay? Because he can solve this equation of motion according to classical physics and predict everything. So if we want to prove that something is random based on physics, we cannot, it's impossible that we do it using classical physics. We have to do something different. So now, well. I'm a quantum physicist. Let's move to the quantum world. Okay? And now you will tell me, well, I know that in quantum physics, things are random. Okay? Because if I open any textbooks in quantum physics, it will tell you that the outputs of quantum measurements are probabilistic, hence random. Okay? This is just one of the postulates of quantum physics tells you that the results of quantum measurements are random. And for instance, a paradigmatic example that I'm going to use during my talk is the following. So if you prepare a photon, single photon, and you send it into a mirror that has transmittivity and reflectivity equal to one half, and you, det you monitor where the you detect where the photon goes, you will see that with 50% probability it will go here and here, and you may argue that this is a random result. Okay? Because all what quantum physics tells you in this situation is that you have uh, a click here or here with probability one half. This is all what the theory is going to tell you. Even if you have better knowledge, well, the theory only tells you the output of the experiment in terms of probabilities. Okay? It's not like in quantum physics, like, OK, maybe I have a better knowledge about this photon, about this mirror. No. All what you can say is that with probability 1 half, it will take this path or this path. Okay? So there's no way of reducing this randomness by improving your control on the device. So this seems nice. Okay? You may argue that the reason why this is random is quantum. but I mean, the quantumness of this experiment, the randomness, sorry, depends on many things. So you have to uh, better make sure that this is a single photon state, that this transmittivity is really equal to one half. Uh, also, if you generate random numbers, you have memory effects. This reduces the randomness in your experiments because randomness means correlations. Correlations means lack of randomness. So if you have a list of random bits, by knowing what happened in the past, you shouldn't be able to predict what is going to be next. But if there are memory effects, this reduces the amount of randomness. So all these things that are related to the setup affect to the randomness that you have in these detectors. Okay? This is the ideal situation, but in reality, things may differ a lot about this. And so we have, again, that our knowledge or, uh, or our ignorance about the device may affect the theoretical randomness this device may get. So this is the problem. I always use this joke because it's perfect for me to illustrate what I want to do. Okay? So we have. Probably you know Dilbert, it's a cartoon, okay? And he wants to, he looks at the random number generator in this company, okay? And this is uh, the random number generator they use, okay? You see? And he wonders whether this is really random, okay? And as he says, uh, there's a problem with randomness, you can never be sure, because as you know, the probability that a perfect random number generator gives you this sequence is the same as any other sequence, okay? So is this random? Well, we would say no, but again, the probability that you get this sequence out of a random number generator is the same as any other sequence. So you can never be sure about whether things are random. Well, you will see that you can be sure about something being random in the quantum region. Okay? And I would like to stress that this is what is happening today. So if you go, as it was mentioned before, randomness is something uh, fundamental, but it's also something that you use uh, for your information devices. So 
Every computer today is equipped with a random number generator. You can also go and there are companies who sell you random number generators. And this is what happens when you go to a company. So you go to a com company and say, and you ask, can you please give me a random number generator? And the company tells you, sure, here it is. Well, this box that you get from the company, you can see as the demon. And you can say, is this random? And the company tells you, yes. OK, so, but OK, there are random number generators. So what are, th what are these random number generators? Well, there are uh, companies that sell you random number generators based on software, based on uh, noise in a laser, and things like this. Are these devices really random? Well, I would argue no, because they are based on classical physics. And there is, these are hard to predict, but I wouldn't say that these are intrinsically random because of the reasons I gave before. But you may uh, know that there are companies that sell you quantum randomness. Okay. Well, good, yes. So the way, basically, this, they are based on this type of experiment. Okay? They, they don't do exactly this, but the logic is more or less the same as you have here. Okay? They send a bin uh, single, uh, they don't do this, but you can see it as sending single photons into a bin splitter. So whatever the solution is, now I will tell you three problems. Three, now are more, I am more in the applied side. I will tell you three practical problems about, about these solutions, about random number generators. So the first problem is about certification. So my, my uh, new uh, ERC fellowship is about certification. This is a problem I, I'm very interested in. Okay? How to certify that devices behave as expected. How to certify that a box you get from a company produces quantum randomness. So if you go to a company that sells you random uh, uh, number generators, classical or quantum, you will get a box and you will ask, how do I know this is random? And they will tell you, because we passed the statistical test. So these are statistical tests that have been designed by NIST, the National Institute of Standard and Technologies. And basically, these tests look for patterns in the sequences. And then if there are patterns, they will tell you probably this is not random. This is what people use to certify randomness. Now, do these tests tell, tell us a lot about the randomness in the symbols? I don't think so. OK, so well, if you don't pass the test, maybe this is bad. But if you pass them, they don't give you any guarantee that what you have is randomness. I think for the quantum solution, this is even worse, because these tests are passed by classical solutions. So if I, buy you, if I sell you a box, I think it's better if I pass a test that is not certified by classical solutions. Because if, if not, you as a customer, you will tell me, why should I buy a quantum solution if the only thing I do is passing some tests that are satisfied by classical solutions? I better use the classical cheaper solution. OK, so I think using this test that doesn't say much. And I think for quantum solution, I think you should, we should look for ways of certifying quantum randomness that are by methods that aren't satisfied by classical solutions. And just for you to understand what this problem is about, I mean, there was a, a, a random number generator that was used in the, I think, in the 60s, 70s. OK, you can, this, there is an entry in Wikipedia about this. OK, so there was a random number generator that people were using at that time. So people were using this uh, math, software method to generate random numbers, and these numbers were random. OK, people were using for simulations, cryptography, and blah, blah. One day, one person had the idea of plotting sets of three numbers generated by these on an x, y, z plane. And then he realized that there was a pattern. Well, are these numbers random? No. If they were random, they would be everywhere. Okay? But these numbers were considered to be random until the day one guy had the idea of putting them into this x, y, z plot. So it's insane. Okay? So these numbers were random, and the day after, they were not random. So this is telling you that statistical test I'm not sure if we can uh, get a lot of confidence out of this, okay? Because you can never exclude that one day looks at the pattern that you didn't look at, okay? And this might be a problem if you want to use these random numbers for cryptography because this person might be your enemy, okay? Who can better predict this uh, randomness. So this is why I don't like this approach. Now, the second problem is that, as I was telling you, many uh, solutions, you require privacy. And I always put the same example. So imagine after my talk, you, have, you know, imagine I, I was a proper engineer, I had my company about quantum random number generators, and you knew about me, and you, you after attending my talk, you, you say like, oh, I was convinced by this need of quantum random number generators, and you came to me, and you wanted the random numbers to run a virtual casino. You have a web page where you have a virtual casino, and you want to secure your, your, uh, your operations by quantum randomness. So you come to me. And you say, look, 
I would like a random number generator for my Bulto Casino. I say, no problem. Do you want the classical or the quantum one? And you say, I want the quantum one because it's more secure. And then I say, like, OK, I will have to charge you twice, but take it, OK? So you take it. So what I do, uh, I have quantum resources. So what I do, I generate these random numbers using a quantum process, say this one. I take all the results, and I copy all the results in a memory, a stick with a lot of capacity, much more than any test you are going to perform. And I, s I put this memory, this memory stick into a box. I paint it in fancy colors. I write quantum random number. I charge you twice, and I give you this box. OK, you go back to your place. You don't really trust me because okay, yeah, I'm Spanish, Latin people, so you shouldn't uh, trust Latin people. And you say, well, let me first check that these numbers are random. So you start generating these numbers. And what it, this, the machine does, it takes the numbers from the memory and takes the numbers. It will pass any statistical test you can think of. So you say, Antonio Thin, nice guy. So you put these numbers in the virtual casino. These numbers are random to you, but they are not random to me because I generated them in advance. So you now understand the problem of random to you or to me. They have to be random to everyone. Because if you use them for your virtual casino, I take all your money. Well, this is because these numbers are not random to everyone. They are not private. Okay, so this is the second problem that we have, and no statistical test is going to uh, ensure that things are random. Okay, this is a bit academical, but it shows that there is a problem. There's an issue. And finally, the, things, the third thing is that even if you trust me that I'm not going to apply this attack, you will say, what did you use to generate the randomness? And I will say, okay, I, I send single photons into a bin splitter and blah, blah. You don't want to care about this. I mean, you're never going to open the box and see if I really place the bin splitter, if my bin splitter has transmission coefficient equal to one half, if I prepare a single photon. These are details of the experiment. You don't want that. So I want things to be able to say something about my experiment from the outside, from the device I get, without having to care about all the details of, the, of my device. Okay? This is the concept that, uh, where we work a lot. I mean, we don't want things that are device dependent, that depend on. Uh, we don't want applications that depend on the details of my devices. I would like to say things only looking at the box I get from the provider. Okay, so I want things to be device independent. Okay, so this is what we want. So our goal is me as observer user, I want to get a box, produce symbols, and from the statistics conclude that these symbols are random, private, that I can use for cryptographic applications. Thank you. I guess after this long introduction, I hope everything is clear about what I want to do. Now let's do it. OK. So not only in classical physics, but even in quantum physics, if you want to do it in this way, me as an observer getting a box, it's impossible to certify that something is random without making more assumptions. Okay? So in a device-independent way, it's impossible. And this is only from the statistics, you see. And this is because any statistics of produced by a single box, you can see it as uh, the, the combination of deterministic strategies. Okay, so I mix with some probability deterministic strategies. And this mixing, you can see it as ignorance. So any randomness that comes from ignorance, I don't like it. Okay, this is like what the same I have in classical physics. And you can see that any statistic that you see from a single box, maybe this is a bit technical, but just believe me that there is nothing like proving randomness from a single box. Another reason is because I can always reproduce with classical uh, uh, physics the behavior of a quantum box, of a single quantum box. Okay? It may be more expensive, but I can always do that. Using classical physics, I can always reproduce the statistics produced by a quantum box. So if I can find a classical explanation for any experiment that is performed on a quantum particle, then as in classical physics there is no randomness, I cannot certify the presence of randomness from a single quantum experiment uh, on a quantum particle. I can certify if I make more assumptions, okay? But just on, only from the statistics I see, I can always reproduce statistics produced by a single system by a classical explanation. And since there is no randomness in classical physics, I cannot certify that the box produces random bits or random symbols. So we have to use more than one system. So this is the way we are going to certify that things are random. So it's going to be the user, and the user now will have access to two systems. And it, I mean, even if, if I write two systems, it's just a single user protocol. It's me who goes to the provider and has two boxes. With these two boxes, I will perform some actions, and I will get some outputs. 
I will see some statistics. And I will conclude that these uh, symbols are random even against a quantum observer. OK, so I will, the way I will do, I will always put boxes, because this is what I get from the provider. I get a box. And I will put here an enemy that might be correlated to the boxes I got. This enemy can even be uh, someone who interfered with the provider and kept a particle that is correlated with the particles I'm getting from the provider. And my goal is to bound the uh, predictability that my enemy has on the symbols that my boxes produce. OK, you see here, I wonder how much this enemy can pr predict the output from the statistics these boxes produce. And these boxes you see here as uh, devices that get an input and an output. So you can think of as these voices, I mean, this is a way of seeing. I mean, I don't think it's the most practical one. But you can think of you going to the provider. The provider gives you two boxes, and these boxes have some buttons. And you can press button one, button two, button three. What happens inside the box when you press button one, you don't know. OK, but clearly, you don't have to put any trust in anyone. You just press button one, or button two, or button three. And the boxes have some lights. And whenever you press a button, one of the lights is on. So the probability here that I write is what's the probability that observing result that light one, two, three, whatever, is on here, and be light three, four is on here when I press button X and button Y. So this is something I can see in my lab. I can spend some time pressing buttons and looking at the lights. Only from this knowledge, I want to conclude that these bits are, these symbols are random. So I don't have to put any trust on the provider. I don't need to know what is inside. If I'm able to predict that the, certify that the symbols are random only from the statistic I see. This is why. And I should be able also to prove that these bits are random even to an adversary. So this is why it will be device independent, because my conclusions, I, I arrive to the conclusions only from the statistics I see. I see it. No one can cheat me. Okay? I see a behavior of my devices. I don't care about what is happening inside the boxes, because I only see the, the statistics that I see. And I will need to prove that this is uh, random to my uh, enemy. OK, so this is my scenario. I will get two boxes. I know with one box, I cannot certify that the thing is random without making uh, assumptions. I will have two boxes, and I want to conclude that these symbols are random with respect to the enemy. Yes? Quick question. When you say two boxes, are you making some assumptions? some sort that these two boxes cannot communicate? Yes. So I will go to that. Very good point. Yes. When I say, what is two boxes? So it is even philosophical. When can I say that two boxes, I have two systems? I think if you have two, bo two devices and these devices communicate, I wouldn't say these are two devices. I would say this is a single device. So for me, if you think about it, two devices mean that the two devices don't communicate. Because two com communicated devices, I would say this is a single device. But practically, it means that I will uh, make sure that these two devices don't communicate. When you say don't communicate, you also mean that there is no single source affecting both of them? No, the, it can be. But what I mean is that the process in which you put the input and get the output should be independent of this process here. But this, these devices may have been produced by a single source. In fact, you get these two devices from the provider. So the provider may have correlated the two devices. But when you come when it, they come to you, you do something here and something there. And these are independent processes. I, th I will come back to this point later. I think it's a very good point. And the only reason why I can do interesting things in this scenario is because these statistics, the, the statistics you can get in classical and quantum physics, differ when you have two de devices. When you have one, you can do everything produced by a quantum device you can do with classical physics. When you have two, this is no longer the case. And here, there is a difference at the level of statistics. And I can exploit this difference to do interesting things for quantum randomness. And this is because two devices violate something called Bell inequalities. I assume there might be people here who don't know about Bell inequalities. This is why I will make a short course on Bell inequalities for you to understand. I'm sorry if everyone knows, OK? But uh, I will assume that not everyone knows. In any case, it's useful for my talk, so let's see. OK, so what is a Bell inequality? So Bell inequality is a concept that usually is explained in quantum physics, but there is nothing quantum in, in, in Bell inequalities. In fact, I was told, I've never checked, that if you go to the books by Boole, the, the inventor of Boole's algebra, there are Bell inequalities in his book before quantum physics. 
So what is a Bell inequality? It's an example, uh, Gedanke an experiment, but you can also make it in practice, in which there is a source, say the provider, who prepares two boxes or prepares two particles. And you make several measurements of several results on these particles. In my case, I'm going to use the simplest Bell inequality, which is called Clauser Horn Shimoni Hall, because of his inventors, its inventors. And you have two measurements of two outputs. Okay, so let's say uh, Paolo in, in his lab prepares two particles that are sent to two different locations, and there you can make two measurements of two outputs of these two particles. Did I say quantum or classical particles? No. I'm just saying two particles. Then you get two measurements. Did I say which measurements? No. You have two options on these two particles that I label with two buttons. Okay, it's the same language I was using before for the provider. And you get two results that I would call plus and minus one. So I want you to understand that we can play a Bell inequality now here. Okay? So I can take Pino, he remains here. I can take Paolo, I send him to, the, to his office. And I, I can, we can share some questions. And I, ask, I go with Paolo, you stay here, and you can ask Pino, okay, tell me a result for one. And Pino will have to say plus or minus one. And I'm in Paolo's office, I say, tell me a result for two. And we have to say plus or minus one. Okay, there is nothing quantum. We can have a Bell game, a Bell scenario here. We can do it now. We are not going to do it, but we could do it. Okay, so you can think as this, Paolo and Pino getting questions, one, two, and saying plus and minus one, okay? And now I will take this combination of uh, results. So this is the result of the first box when you ask about one. What this one means, it can be measuring a photon, it can be asking Paolo, it can be whatever. Okay, but it has to produce a result, and this result can be whatever, but I will call it plus one or minus one. It's a convention. So this is, uh, whenever this box produces one, this is the result of the machine when you press button one, and this is the result of the machine when you press button one. And this can be plus one or minus one, depending on the choice of the machine. Okay, it may seem weird, but now you will understand why I took this combination. Let's compute this function. So usually what we leave is, this is what we do in classical physics, these numbers have a value. You only make the experiment and you reveal this value. Okay, so they have well-defined values, plus and minus one. And you can see that this number is always bounded by two. Okay, there is no deep mathematics here. Let's make an example. Let's assume that everything is plus one. So this is plus one times plus one, that makes plus one, plus, plus one times plus one, it makes plus one, plus, plus one times plus one, it makes plus one, minus, plus one times plus one, it makes minus one. So you have one plus one plus one minus one, it makes two. Okay, well, we do deeper things in my group, okay? But just for you to understand <laughs> that this is something that everyone can cal calculate for all possible values of plus and minus one, you will see that this combination is two and minus two, so at most it's two. I think these rules are super clear it's a pity what we don't, okay. Everyone can uh, believe that this is going to happen, right? This number is going to be bounded by two. Okay, what you can see is that in quantum physics you can violate this condition. Okay, so if you prepare two quantum particles and you make two measurements, this is the state you have to prepare, which is a maximum entangled state of two qubits, and you make this measurement, it doesn't really matter, okay? I can violate this quantum physics. Actually, you can get even two square root of two. Okay, if you have never seen this and you are not surprised, my talk is a failure. I think this is incredible that quantum physics violates this. Okay, so how come this combination of plus and minus one that should be two or minus two, how come quantum physics allows to violate by more than two? I think this is amazing. I mean, this has been proven, okay? So it's not a theory, it happens. Quantum physics predicts it and you can see it. It's so amazing that I think you could, we, don't, we cannot do it now because we cannot prepare these particles, these entangled particles that violate this, okay? But if we had them, I think you could even make money. You could go to the streets, explain these rules to people and say, what do you give me if I get something larger than two? And for you, it would be enough to prepare this particle, have it in your pocket, then you get the question, you get the particle, you measure, and depending on the result, you give the result, okay? And I'm sure people will be betting results and you get in the money. Because it's just common sense. It defies our common sense. And you may think like, okay, what could be wrong? Because I mean, I was doing just plus and minus one multiplying and summing, okay? There was, I mean, my reasoning was correct. I was not making mistakes, mathematical mistakes. It would be, I would be stupid if I were doing mathematical mistakes with this. So the only thing that was wrong, okay, one thing is that they didn't communicate, but I'm assuming that this is happening. 
I only made one assumption. Observables have well-defined defi values before the experiment. And this is the only thing I used to conclude that it was 2 or minus 2. So if I get something larger than 2, it means that these observables didn't have well-defined values. Because if they had, this number is bounded by 2. So if I get something larger than 2, these numbers cannot have predetermined values. Hence, they are random. This is why a violation of Bell inequality, which is something I can do with quantum physics that I can not do with classical physics, it's something that I can observe from the statistics I see with, bo with boxes, tells me that these numbers are random. Because if they were not random, someone, maybe not me, someone, could have a list with values for these numbers. But if this happened, this combination would be bounded by 2. Okay, so I'm proving not only that these numbers are random to me, but to anyone else. Again, because if someone had the least of these outputs written deterministically, well, this number could never be larger than 2. Okay, this is why a Bell inequality violation proves me that my devices are quantum because I cannot violate Bell inequalities. They are random, and they are random to everyone else. Again, because if someone else had these numbers, this would be plus and minus 1 in advance, and this number would be bounded by 2. OK, if you have never seen this, you may be surprised. But this is just a logical uh, argument with no flows, OK? So if things are plus and minus 1 written in advance, even someone else had these numbers, this would be 2 at most. And then I go to the lab, and I see that it's not 2. Hence, my assumption is wrong. OK, so now we see that the violation of Bell inequality, a fundamental result in quantum physics, ensures me that my boxes are random and quantum from the statistics I see. I don't need to trust the provider. I don't need to open the box to see that there are single photons going into a transmittivity. Just from the statistics I see, I can prove that things are random. Like the demon Dilbert, from the statistics that the box generates, I can prove that things are random. OK, so this is, if you have your virtual casino, you better ask two devices that violate a inequality, and then use the outputs generated by these two devices to choose the numbers in your virtual casino. I won't be able to predict these numbers. Well, then you can make things more uh, quantitative. This is what we did in a paper some years ago. So basically what we did was we could bound the randomness. Okay, So this is uh, one, Okay, maybe the choice is not good. One means no randomness. And one half means perfect randomness. This is the predictability by an enemy. Okay, so if the predictability is one half for a symbol of two outputs, it means that there is no predictability. Okay, because it's like a random coin. And as a function of the Bell inequality violation, remember the, the classical value was two, and the maximal value was two square root of two. I can bound the randomness produced by the devices as a function of the Bell inequality violation. So the logic you don't apply any statistical test at an east. You take the boxes, you violate a Bell inequality, and from these you can get the amount of randomness these boxes generate. And simply, this region is impossible. So I'm not going to say that, but you can prove that this is the best an, if an enemy can do. So if you are here, even an enemy doesn't have any knowledge, perfect knowledge about the devices, which will be here. OK, so now let's, this is the Fundamental application, OK? So you use something fundamental, Bell inequalities, to do a new type of random number generators that are private, that are device independent, and for which you certify that they are random. So what did I use for that? OK, I assume that my devices are quantum. And we needed two systems. So what I think this is interesting. What does it mean, two systems, OK? I think two systems means if you have two boxes and these two boxes can communicate, again, I wouldn't call these two systems, OK? Because if they communicate, well, this is just a single system exchanging information. So I think two systems, I mean that there is something that is happening here, which is not communicating with something that is happening here, OK? So if you want, even in, this means like uh, this is something that is fundamental for our understanding. Now I'm a bit more philosophical, for our understanding of science. So when I make an experiment here, and I describe my experiment here, of course, I believe that this is an isolated region where I can make predictions that does not depend on something that is happening somewhere else. else. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense that I make predictions here. It may be dependent on something that is happening outside me. Okay? So well, maybe this, uh, I don't want to enter into that. But the only thing I want to say is that I really need these two systems for my, my process to be valid. 
how am I doing with time? How much? It's about to, okay, I have some other. You do have three minutes. Okay. Okay, so, yes. Okay, this is too long, so I will summarize what I, what I want to say here. So, this is what I needed, okay? I need a system, a region, where I can put an input and produce an output, and I need another region where I can put an input and produce an output for my argument to hold. Okay. So, if you become uh, uh, really uh, fundamental, so what I need is that this particle doesn't know about this input here. Okay, this is the only thing why I can say this this system here does not have access to the input I put here and output I produce here. Now, if you really become a purist, what does it mean that this uh, system does not have access to this uh, symbol there? It means that this system cannot predict this symbol there. So you could argue that this symbol is random. Which is true, okay? So it seems that I am using randomness to generate randomness, so it brings some circularity to the argument. Okay, so if you want really to argue about whether nature is a deterministic or random, the only reason why nature can be proven to be random is because of Bell inequalities, but you, strictly speaking, you need random numbers to uh, run a Bell test. Okay, I would give you two reasons why I don't think this is so serious, okay? The first one, for practical applications, I can make the extra assumption that what happens here is not correlated to what I, the measurement I decide to implement there. So for instance, if I want to make a device, I get these two boxes from my provider, and I will choose which button to press depending on how I feel that day, or how, what's the Twitter, the symbol 31 in the last Twitter message I got. I will assume that this does not affect the behavior of my photons. But I think this is something logic that I will be willing to accept, okay? Now, if you really want to prove whether nature is random, well, it could be that everything was written in advance and my, there is a correlation between my, the character number 23 in tweet, my last Twitter message I got and the behavior of a photon. Okay, if you are purist and you want to prove things are random. But I think for devices, to make devices, you can make an assumption that what I do here does not affect the behavior of my photons. This is the first thing. The second thing is that even if you assume that you need randomness here, you can do interesting things with that. So for instance, you can prove that you need less randomness here than the randomness you get there. So you can expand the randomness. So there is some randomness that come, came from the quantum devices. So you can prove that you need n random bits to run the Bell test, and you get m random bits where m is larger than n. You can expand the randomness. Okay, so you can, even if you are willing to accept this circularity that you need random bits to run a Bell test, you can get more random bits out of the Bell test that you needed in advance. Still, as I was saying, I think the only thing you need to assume is that what you need to choose the input is not correlated to the particles you measure. Okay, maybe this is a bit more for the expert. I hope it was more or less clear what, what I meant here. And actually, you can also uh, make devices and experiments out of this. So, uh, I'm a theorist, but sometimes we collaborate with experiments, and we had this idea. We uh, talked to a group in the States where they had experiments where they had two uh, ions, okay? Maybe, I'm not an experimentalist. I took this picture from, I got this picture from them. So they had two ions, okay? And the two ions represent the two boxes, and they are separated by a meter. So we're assuming that when you make a, a measurement on one ion, is independent of when you make another measurement on, on that ion. And then we were choosing the input with the computer and getting the output. And at that time, we could generate 42 uh, random bits out of the experiment, which is ridiculous, okay? I mean, any random number generator has a much higher rate, but it was a proof of principle. It was even funny because, okay, we made this, with this paper, we made it in nature. It's the only nature paper I have. We were all very happy and excited. And of course, when you make a paper in nature, you get the journalists that come to you and they want to know more, okay? And I remember there was a journalist who asked me, why 42? <laughs> And, and she was even wondering, there is this book about the <laughs> high chai guy to the galaxy. I haven't read it, okay? And she was telling, is, the, is it because of the book? And I say, look, it was 42, it was random, okay? <laughs> so just the experimentalists, our colleagues, they were tired of getting numbers. They stopped and they sent us the data and we computed with our techniques how much randomness they had generated and it was 42. 
It was funny, so I, I didn't know. I, I haven't read the book, so then I knew that it's the answer to the most fundamental question in the universe, something like this, right? And I mean, that was a proof of principle. These are people who are taking seriously this, and the National Institute of Standard Technologies, they care a lot about standards, and they have a project because they understand that, in a way, this is the purest form of randomness, and they are generating, they are making experiments to generate this randomness in this uh, randomness beacon. Okay, and they are generating randomness using Bell test. And in the longer term, this is much more demanding. Once you have certified randomness, you can also use this for cryptography. So now, if the Bell test, you do it at distance between Alice and Bob, if, I, if I'm able to run a Bell test between me and Bar when I'm back to Barcelona and Paolo, who is, remains here in Padua, well, then we will have measurements on a maximum entangled state. These measurements will be random, but they will be correlated and what is correlated randomness is a secret key. A secret key is something that is random, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, but it's correlated to what my friend has. Okay, whenever I have a 0, my friend has a 0. Whenever I have a 1, my friend has a 1. And we can use this to encrypt messages. So you can also make cryptography key distribution out of this certified quantum randomness. Okay, with this, I conclude. So there are, again, my main goal was to prove randomness. And my first message was to tell you that you can certify uh, the presence of randomness, quantum randomness, using uh, a violation of Bell inequality, that's something that we call non-local correlations. Okay? And this is the only way. So if you want to be sure only from the statistics, from this demon that says 9999 that something is random, the only way you can do that is with quantum physics. And the only way you can know that some boxes are quantum is by violating a Bell inequality. Of course, you can then make more assumptions and do other ways of certifying. But if you only, you want to do it only from some of the correlations, from other statistics, the only way is a Bell inequality violation. So good thing is that the randomness generate what well, is certified by the Bell inequality violation is private. No one can have a copy because if there, wa there, there was a copy, you couldn't violate a Bell inequality, and it's device independent. I can go to the provider, get the boxes. If my boxes violate a Bell inequality, I keep them. If they don't, I give them back. I don't have to put any trust on the provider. Okay, the attack I was telling you with the memory stick is not possible. <coughs> it's difficult because it requires two different devices. It also requires a process where you use the inputs in a, in a way that cannot be correlated to, to the devices. I think this is possible. But it's okay. It would introduce some circularity in the argument. And this is not only fundamental, but it can be designed because certified quantum randomness is a useful resource for uh, information applications. And with this, I conclude. Thank you very much for your attention. Questions? Could you expand a little bit about why violating uh, the Bell inequalities implies somehow that there is no correlation between subsequent uh, outputs of the device? Okay, no. Okay, then this is a good uh, question. I didn't go into that. Of course, uh, here I gave the simplest explanation of the protocol. Uh, a, a Bell inequality by its... Okay, there are two answers to this question. Okay, I gave the simplest explanation about the protocol. Of course, Having a final protocol for randomness generation is not only observing a Bell inequality violation. So from the Bell inequality violation, you have to make some post-processing to avoid possible um, correlations between uh, uh, memory effects in your device. Okay? What happens is that the, the Bell, inequality, uh, Bell inequality violation has a property that is called uh, monogamy. Okay? So I will give you a, an example here. Let me just go back. OK, so I was taking this uh, uh, CHSH Bell inequality, okay, which was written here. OK, this is the Bell inequality violation that it's bounded by 2. This is Bell inequality. It's bounded by 2 for classical physics. And in quantum physics, you can go to 2 square root of 2. OK? Now, if you work on this number, and you tell me, OK, give me all the quantum uh, processes that that can achieve 2 square root of 2 for the Bell inequality violation. Okay? All possible 
tell me all possible states and measurements that can, can give me 2 square root of 2. OK, so the idea is that you go to the lab, you measure this number, you get 2 square root of 2. You have to tell me what are, what's the state you are being measuring and which measurements. So in principle, there can be many states and many measurements that give this 2 square root of 2. OK? Well, it happens that there is only one quantum realization compatible with this number, which is the one I'm giving you here. OK, the only way you can get 2 square root of 2 is by making measurements on this state. This state is pure. OK, I don't know if you know quantum physics, but uh, OK. This state is not to know what is pure. Uh, pure, it means that it's not correlated to every, anything else. OK, so this is telling you that the, the state you have in these boxes at this moment in time is not correlated to anything else, including a second use of the box. So the Bellini quality violation is monogamous because it's not correlated to anything else, including second possible use of the box or uh, the possible enemy. This monogamy property is what allows you to, it's another way of seeing why by seeing this number, you know that no one has correlations to this output because this state is not correlated to anything else. So this is why the Bellini quality violation also gives you information about memory effects in your device. And this is why you can also solve them. In this particular case, there are no memory effects. When the violation is not the optimal one, well, you may have some memory effects, you may have some correlation with the enemies, and there are techniques that allow you to deal with this. So the important property for all what matters is that since you have some lack of predictability, as soon as you have a bell inequality violation, you can use some classical information theory machinery to distill good randomness out of this partial randomness. And this was something, we didn't invent this in quantum physics. People in classical information theory, they had things called randomness extractors that distill good randomness out of partial randomness. So if you have the best uh, violation, you have perfect randomness. You don't have it, since you have this non-trivial bound on the randomness, you can do some machinery and distill good randomness out of the partial randomness and this remove the memory effects out of partial memory effects. So the good thing is that the Bell inequality gives you an estimation of this partial randomness, and that's enough to run all the machinery. I was wondering if mm, there are any existing research lines or if you have an idea of a possibility to overcome the problem of circularity in the argument of well, okay, this circularity, okay, this circularity, in a way, we come back to my uh, initial point about proving randomness. So what I'm demanding is that the, my choice of input somehow has to be, has to contain some randomness, independence, you name it, okay? Again, I can never exclude the possibility that some th everything was written in the Big Bang. Okay, now I'm becoming philosophical, but this is the, and when you discuss about discularity, I think you are entering into more, more philosophical discussions or about whether nature is random or not. So I can never exclude that everything was written in advance, including my choice of measurements for this particle and this choice of measurement for this particle, and this information was available to the particles when leaving the source because everything was produced at the Big Bang, okay? And the Big Bang wrote what I was going to measure for the photon two, what I was going to measure in the photon one, and how the photos were going to behave that day when I was going to make the experiment. It's a bit insane, but logical, this is, a, this is a logical possibility. So this is why, but then pff, that everything was written in the Big Bang is a bit unsatisfactory, let's say, you know? So this is why I think if you care about whether nature is random, you can only prove it. You make this sort of independent assumption that what I choose to measure is not known by the photons when leaving the source. I think this, for practical application, is a very valid assumption. Okay, so I would say this circularity affects more uh, the discussion of whether nature is random, whether nature plays dice, and things like this, rather than a protocol. But I cannot exclude this possibility that everything was planned in advance. Still, as I said, you can then say, okay, I'm not generating randomness, but I'm expanding randomness. I assume I have some initial randomness, and you can prove that from some initial randomness, you can get more randomness which is, again, something classically impossible. So if I give you some randomness, if you make processing of this randomness, you won't create more randomness. Here, if you give me some randomness, I run the Bell test, and I give you back more randomness. So uh, at the present, you are saying there are no certified randomness devices uh, available for 
uh, for example, those uh, sold by the e-quantic uh, in mm -hmm. Geneva. Are you say, following your yeah, yeah, discussion, sure. is not a, a true? Well, the uh, <laughs> so I want to make clear something. I'm not saying they are not using quantum physics to generate their symbols. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that there is no quantum process inside the box. Okay. What I'm saying is that uh, you have to put a lot of trust, not only believing, but uh, God knows what happened in this box, okay, since the point they, it was created, okay? The only thing I'm saying is that if you go to them, you can go to the web page. I mean, the owner is a very good friend of mine, okay? So I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm telling you the truth, okay? I like him a lot. But if you go to the web page and you see how they certify that their devices are random, they will tell you, we pass all statistical tests. And this, I'm sorry, I have cheaper classical solutions that do that. Then I have to put trust on him. He's a very nice guy. And if he told me that he used quantum resources, I have to believe him. But there is nothing from what they give me, there is nothing <coughs> to prove that. I think this is also a question for standardization. So we will have quantum devices, and we need to develop ways of certifying these quantum devices. If you have, well, this is what my ERC is about. You will have quantum computer, and the computer will solve a problem that is impossible for a classical computer. So the quantum computer will give you a result. An Italiana. <laughs> what do you do with this result? The same for randomness. So you have randomness, and you pass all statistical tests that every classical machine does, and you say, is this quantum? The only thing you have is the provider that tells you. So there is nothing like certified by the statistics at the moment, that the quantum origin of your symbols. How long uh, do we have to wait for uh, <laughs> buying a certified randomness? Well, this, I don't know. I think, um, again, <laughs> may I say one go to experiments? But, uh, uh, well, it's, uh, it's challenging because you have to make a, what is called a proper bell test. But I would say five years, I would, well, I don't know. Probably Paolo knows, or you know, they know better than me. Of course, look, I think also what people have, I think some people have understood is like we had the first generation of devices where you were putting a lot of trust on the providers. So I don't know if you are aware, but the, this company was also selling you cryptography. And this quantum cryptography was uh, uh, believed to be unbreakable. I even wrote papers saying that it's unbreakable. Well, there were some researchers that went to the company bought the devices, and they hacked them. How come? OK. Well, it's because uh, when you, the, the, the protocols, they make a lot of assumptions about the devices. OK. They say a protocol of cryptography, standard cryptography, tells you you prepare a qubit. The qubit is sent from one place to another, and things like this. Huh? And what you buy from a provider is not a qubit. It's a laser doing very weird operations. And there is always a mismatch between the theory and the experiment. So what we have learned is that we make a lot of assumptions for our current uh, cryptographic randomness generation. So if you don't prepare a single photon and your mirror is not one half, one half, this is not a perfect random number. So this is the basis we are using today. What I'm telling you is the highest level of abstraction where only from the statistics you can s make sure that things work without making an assumption. And in between, there is a gray region where, OK, maybe you don't want to reach this level of abstraction. You can still make some assumptions, put some trust on the provider, but still get a better solution than what we have today. So there's a lot of, well, here they work a lot on this semi-device independent gray region. I think we should uh, change our ways of certifying things. It cannot be that the only reason why you know something is quantum because the provider uh, swear that it was quantum. Uh, I would like to ask, uh, apart from the cryptography that you underlined pretty well, which are nowadays the situation where we need uh, a pretty well described the randomness or devices that provide us a great randomness uh, uh, level. I mean, in our common use, maybe a classical random generator could be enough for uh, everyday situation or just simple simulation that we have to do. What mm -hmm. are the um, the uses we need this quantum randomness generators for. Okay, I'm not an expert on this thing. I must say, like, uh, okay, I think I wouldn't diminish cryptography. Okay, if you uh, someone gets your n money, well, then you will appreciate the virtue of having good random numbers. Okay, but I would say probably for simulations, I'm not sure about what's the state of the art. Uh, I know in the past there, w there, w there is, uh, 
when I was writing my first paper on randomness, I, I, there was, I found a PRL paper where people w uh, were using a random number generator at that time to compute the ground state of a system that, for which they knew the ground state, OK? And they didn't get it because the random number was bad. Now, whether you can achieve good enough randomness for simulations with classical techniques, maybe. OK, I'm not sure if you really need to go into this type of quantum solutions, OK? This has to, it's not clear. The good thing is that also in this approach is that you never have a quantitative idea about the quality of your random, OK? You pass this statistical test, OK? But there, always must, there might always be a pattern that you didn't look at it, OK? Well, here, there is a quantitative est estimation. From the Bell inequality violation, with this curve, I can give you the amount of randomness. And this is something that in classical random number generators, people are interested in, having estimations of entropy, statistical estimations of entropy. I mean, random, classical random number generator, it's very hard to estimate the randomness that the device produces. But OK, I don't know. To give a short answer, I don't know. And it's possible that for simulations, you don't need to go into the quantum realm, especially for cryptography and privacy that is useful. I have only ju just a question, uh, a comment. Remember, we are in the department where we are looking to predictability and we want mm -hmm. to know systems, so we don't like randomness <laughs> in, in, in our system when they work. So this is a different way to see these things. Uh, I, I was very very well impressed of your talk. I think I learned something new, and so I want uh, maybe all the audience can join me to thank you for uh, for this nice nice talk. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>